I hardly ever talk for 45 minutes because talking about human beings in the brain is so complex um, that it always goes over time. So let me apologize ahead of time that I won't cover all of what I would like to cover and maybe not all of what you want to hear. But I will do something atypic uh, for this style um, and ask, is there anything that you really want to know about boys' brains or girls' brains, because that's my topic. I can talk about anything else, but we'll limit it to that. Is there anything that you really want to know about girls' brains and boys' brains before I begin? If I could have one or two people tell me what they're dying to know, that hand was up first, it will help me. Yes? I can give you a handy dandy chart as long as you don't follow it perfectly because there's slippage and slidage in the brain. You know, not all two year olds who turn two on the same day can do and think and you know, you know that, right? So as long as you don't take it too literally or too exactly, I will give you that. And we are stunned by some of the age differences. Yes. Yes. <coughs> Oh, Lord. <laughs> or Allah or Buddha. I, I try to be ecumenical. Um, let, me, let me quickly say this. In case you were trying to judge how old I was with my gray hair, and I, and I have wrinkles too, although they're filled out often with puffy cheeks. Um, I'm 65. I have opinions on everything. <laughs> deep opinions, almost all of them absolutely correct. <laughs> but I'm going to work hard in this 45 minutes not to give you my opinion. So I can give you what the research says about that, not Joanne Deke's opinion. Joanne Deke's opinion will not be heard for the next 45 minutes. Even if it kills me, it's not coming out. So I, I can and will give you the research. What I'll do is I'll try to embed it in what I'm talking about, but if I don't make it, I'll give five minutes at the end and say, what didn't I answer? that you want to know. Um, two more, and then I will forge ahead. Yes? These are for all things so uh, no, you have to either buy me uh, tea at Sarah Beth's or something um, <laughs> for that. No. I do have a personal opinion and a professional opinion. I might come close to telling you the professional one. Um, but usually, I only answer questions if we have sturdy research to support it. The reason I do that. You're hearing different people talk today. Sometimes, not here at the Y, but sometimes one expert will say one thing and another expert will say another thing. And it doesn't help you as parents, does it? Because then you really are in the dark about what to do. So I try to stay in the category of things that we now have a body of knowledge. Because we can now, we've been brain imaging brains for 20 years. And we know some things that are good for brains and not for others. I just thought I'd turn around and show you my jacket on the way back. For example, quick one. This is neurotransmitter enhancement fluid. Research clearly shows that if a neurologic unit, you, your child, doesn't drink sips of water every hour, the neurotransmitter fluid in the brain doesn't operate as well, and that brain can never work at its full power. Did you hear me? Now, we're going to get beyond the formula years, but after that, water. I didn't say Diet Coke, and I didn't say coffee or tea. This is not Joanne Deke's opinion. We have sturdy research to show that. So I want to stick with those things that are stunningly important and yet stunningly simple to do. But I also, my major task is to talk to you about the difference between boy and girl brains because we are stunned by many of the differences. I hear that there are lines here that I can't go beyond or above because if I do, weird sounds happen. I'm beginning to feel like Katherine Hepburn only shorter and plumper. Uh, one more. Yes? Well, 
I'm going to assume you're hearing what people are saying, so I don't have to repeat it, but you're not. Um, she wanted to know how to do some what I call gender balancing. How do you get girls to do some things that maybe they're not interested in, like play in the block corner, because early playing with blocks leads to later, those parts of the brain later do math, science, and abstract thinking. So what you want your girls to play with blocks and movable toys as much as boys. Boys who are doing that are getting ready for all the hard sciences. But if you let girls, they don't do that, many of them, do they? They talk and dress up and talk and dress up. And we're going to see that what you do in the first five, ten to five to ten years of your life formats what we call the end point for the rest of your life. So if you want to be a famous scientist or a world-class architect, what you do in the first 10 years of life will set how far that can go. You can keep making parts of your brain better. That's called plasticity for all of your life. But to get to the highest end point that your brain can get to, it has to have been started during a window. And most of the windows are in the first 10 years of life. The second book out there that's mine about adolescence, we're also stunned by how many windows are in the second decade of life. But that's a whole other conversation. So think of your questions. I can see that you have more than I'm going to let out right now. That's my fault for instigating you. Um, so I won't give you my opinion. You can have access to a PDF of everything I cover after this. I will tell you at the end, remind me, how to get the PDF. The reason I do that, I work with schools a lot, and we're begging middle and high school teachers because the research shows that concurrent taking of notes while learning something complex or new de-enhances learning. That's why I want to give you a PDF afterwards. You should only write down things that you have an aha about because ahas go away from you. So quick, write something down if you think, oh, I should be doing that, or oh, I shouldn't be doing that. That leads me to say I didn't sleep well last night. I worry about talking to parents. I'm talking, going to talk about the brain of boys and girls and windows and some things that need to happen. You're already running as fast as you can as a parent, aren't you? And now I don't want you to feel you have to run even faster when I get done, that there's even more that you have to do. So I'm going to try to follow the razor's edge of talking about some important things, but also being relieving that you don't have to do everything. So please, please don't hear me say, I want you to do even more than you're doing. Maybe something slightly differently, or maybe a different distribution. But every parent that I know is doing the best they can and running as fast as they can. So I wanted to talk about gender. You saw in the first slide, let me, yes, I'll follow Ned Hallowell. You notice he had gray hair. I think he takes his off more for a shtick. I take mine off because I'm 65 and I get hot. Um, by the way, these are brains, real brains. Brain images. Isn't that something? A doctor gave that to me. Ah, yeah. oh, well, I digress. I want you to go on the genderspectrum.org to get all kinds of information, because I show you a picture of a stereotypic girl and boy here. And often when I say I'm going to talk about sex differences in the brain or above the neck, we start to envision boys and girls. But gender isn't monolithic. Gender isn't a single thing. If you look carefully at the literature that's coming out, and I just spent three hours yesterday in Philadelphia talking to a room full of people about this, gender is more of a spectrum. And there are actually four components that happen with gender. This part is called your sex, or your natal sex, what you were born with, OK? But you can be born even with this on a continuum. You don't get to choose where you're born on this continuum. If you're born in the middle, you don't get to choose that. That's a done deal at birth. Then your gender identity is up here. 
I'm going to show you brains. Transgendered people, for instance, this doesn't match this. Their brain has the format of a female, for instance, and their body parts may be male. This causes real problems when you have a disconnect between this and this, and it's not a choice. It's a done deal at birth. <coughs> then, this is called gender orientation. Who are you attracted to? Who do you love? But real brain people don't put it here. We put it up here, because the heart doesn't feel. The heart doesn't motivate sexual orientation. The limbic system in the brain does. So this is a done deal at birth, too. I'm going to say that to you again. <laughs> These three things are a done deal at birth. When the head comes out of the birth canal, and if they're in alignment, if my brain tells me I'm a girl, my body parts match that, and my body is a girl's body, and I'm attracted to males, there is less pain and suffering and mental health and emotional issues. But if there's any disconnect, if the three aren't in what we call a cisgender or perfect alignment, then we have exceedingly rough things ahead in terms of mental health problems, sociologic problems, blah, 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 blah. And we're pushing really hard for parents and teachers to identify very early in life when there is a mismatch so that we can begin to do the work that allows human beings to be as happy and healthy as possible. So I'll just throw that out there because that's a three-hour lecture on that. But I want you to know that we're looking very differently at gender, whether it's related to the brain, the body, or our emotions. The only thing you have a choice about is the fourth one, your gender expression. How do you express the package that you came into the world with? That's the only choice that you have. You should see some of your faces. I'm going to go on to better and easier things to talk about. So I'm going to do something different for me. I'm going to tell you what I want you to get out of what I'm talking about right up front. And then I'm going to prove my case to you after the fact. The first thing that I want everybody in here to understand is this. Every brain is unique. We come into the world with all these sections in our brain. I tend to hold this up and say, we brain people look at your brain like this. The part that does visual stuff is back here. The part that does language is here. The part that does motoric part is up here. And all these little sections come in different sizes. For instance, the visual part of my brain came in huge because of my great grandmother who had a photographic memory. My genetic brother, the visual part of his brain was this big even though we have the same IQ. You don't get to choose what size the different parts of your brain are. That's a done deal, too, when it comes out of the birth canal. And what you were lucky enough to get big, what I call big rubber bands in, or a lot of neurons, that's what your aptitude is. So my visual memory was so good, this doesn't um, expand well, so I'm going to use this one that all I had to do was be shown a word and told what it was when I was four. And the brain is an organ, but it acts like a muscle. And the more you use it, especially if you use it during a window, the more it grows. So at four, I started to read and write and spell until by the age of 10, I was the best speller in the state of Ohio. Piece of cake. My genetic brother was a good boy. But he had to study spelling words, sound them out, practice writing them. Do you know what I'm saying? And he became an excellent speller. And he was older than I. And had I been a slug and not used part of my brain, he would have always been a better speller. And I thought he was going to be. I can't quite hold this down. I don't have enough hands. But remember where it is. And then I started. Parents, you don't get to choose the sections of your child's brain. And it does not match yours. Nor does it match the father, or the mother, or the grandmother, or the grandparents. Different sections come from different parts of the ancestral pool, so that every human being gets a unique set of rubber bands. 
and aptitude is very much related to the initial size. And then, as people like Ned and Catherine said, you don't have to live with what you got. You can change it, like my brother did. And that's your job in the first 10 years of life to structure things such that whatever areas your child came in with little rubber bands in, that they do something to stretch them enough to keep the elasticity alive. More on that as we go along. So that's the first thing I want you to get out of this. Even though every brain is an individual, there are gender patterns in the brain. And I'm gonna actually show you now a functional MRI that shows you a classic difference between a male and a female brain. This is a male brain image at one instant in time from the bottom up, see the teeth, and top down, female brain, they were asked to listen and do what we call language processing. The parts that are being used show up different colors. We know that language processing in the male brain is on the left side, right about here. Same task, same kind of format of a brain. I mean, she has one too, but language processing is on both sides. It is a no-brainer <laughs> that, in general, young girls will move into verbal complexity and vocabulary a little earlier than boys. A boy will still be saying he digged a ditch, and a girl will be on to he dug a ditch. And this is why. There are exceptions, obviously. Here's another example. These are girls' brains who are rhyming, I mean rhyming and spelling, and a boy brain that is rhyming and spelling. So even though we have all the same pieces, parts, when we ask them to work, they often use them in a different constellation, and they grow up or reach readiness at different ages. The next thing I want you to get out of this is that it's the behaviors and the beliefs that are learned, not your learning style, not your sexual orientation, not your aptitude. And if you can, I'd like you either looking at me or the slide. The reason I say this to you is you heard Katherine Steiner Adair. I didn't get to hear all of it, but those of you who are texting and emailing in here, you cannot learn as deeply from what I'm saying if you're doing that. And I'm on stage, and I can see you. <laughs> and remember I said the heart isn't really here, it's here. It hurts my amygdala <laughs> to look out at you texting and instant messaging. I really mean this seriously. This is important stuff, please. It's your child's life. So stick with me, okay? So many behaviors and beliefs are learned. When something is learned, it can be changed. That's the difference. I can't take my brain and say, you're not a good visual learner, <laughs> unless I take a brick and hit myself back here. But I can say, I want to be a better auditory learner, so I'm going to do the work and do the behaviors that make that part bigger. But I will always be a better visual than auditory learner, even though I make one bigger, OK? So as parents, one of the things I really want you to think about is, what uniqueness of your child is something you don't want to mess with? And what parts do you want to modulate slightly while there's great plasticity there? Because plasticity every 10 years that you live begins to become less plastic. And anytime you want a human being to improve or change, all of us in the field will tell you, for most things we prefer the first 10 years of life, for some we'll give you the second 10 years too. Let me give you an example. The parts of the brain that go together to read fluently 
are at peak, peak <coughs> plasticity between the ages of four and 10. That doesn't mean with every four-year-old you should start phonics, because phonics for boys probably shouldn't start until age six, which we're going to see. But you do want to do the pre-reading things. You also, if, you, if we're dealing with dyslexia, Ned confessed to you that he was dyslexic, we now know how to diagnose dyslexia much better. And if you do the remediation that we know works now with dyslexics, sometime between the ages of four and 10, you can almost make those parts of the brain fluid readers. After age 10, we in the brain field basically say good luck. The key is not to start too early in the auditory areas because that's the second part of the brain to develop, the visual is first. So with early dyslexics, we have to watch, but you wanna begin your work hopefully no later than five or six, because it's pretty hard at four. So those, that kind of plasticity is important and we can change some of the behaviors. And so sex differences or gender differences in the brain are a real mixture of nature and nurture. If you ask me how much, and if anybody answers that question for you, run away from them because we don't know. All we know is it's a real mixture. And for some who come in with very strong hard wiring like Mozart, no matter what you did to that man, that boy, music would not stop in his head. Why? He came in with such big rubber bands in those areas, you weren't going to change him. So the more extreme, if you will, that a neurologic characteristic is coming into the world, you're not gonna change it much. And so nature will hold. But if it's more moderate, then you have more of a cha chance to change it, okay? The next thing I want you to get out of this is, no matter how your brain comes into the world, the first magic decade provides huge opportunities for change. If you read the literature, these are called windows of sensitivity or windows of opportunity. And these are very important for you to understand. Catherine talked a little bit about it. The one, I don't know if she, I couldn't hear part of her. Did she talk to you about Patricia Kuehl? I hope you can go on TED.com, not right now while I'm talking. <laughs> but TED.com should be an app on one of your appliances because you can get some of the best research and best speakers in the world. And if you go on TED.com and put in Patricia Kuhl, K-U-H-L, she and her team in Seattle have brain imaging that isn't any place else in the world yet and they are looking at infants as soon as they come out of the birth canal. And get this, I think Catherine talked about it, for the first year-ish, we're not sure how much longer because the research hasn't been there long enough, but for the first year-ish, even talking or listening to a mother or father's voice by video or audio has no impact on the language centers. Isn't that something? So between birth and three, you don't want time with an iPad. One of the main reasons, it takes away the quantity of time of hearing the voice and words. And even if the iPad or the iPhone or the TV has words, it doesn't change the language centers. That's the most serious thing. The second thing is, the visual part of the brain isn't designed to learn from two-dimensional. In the first five years of life, it grows tremendously if it's doing three-dimensional work. So you want very little two-dimensional visual work happening in the first five years. Are you hearing the things that I'm saying that are based in research and go counter to much of what is happening in early childhood education and with parents? Why do we care? Because if you try to use parts of the brain before they're ready, some very not good things happen. One, the amygdala, the feeling center part of the brain, starts to get turned off to that early. And if that happens, even when the readiness happens in the brain, that emotional part will always nag at it. 
That's why we have so many remedial reading, reading boys, because we start with phonics too early. And then when their brain is able to hear short vowel sounds, which doesn't happen in most boys until age six, then when they're able to hear that, then they think something's wrong with them and it's hard and they just give up kind of thing. So these windows are very important to attend to. And we're trying to get parents and early childhood teachers to deal with them. How many years ago now? Nine years ago. Scientific American Mind, which is a journal that even though it's a scientific journal, it has great articles that are decently easy to read, and you can trust the information in Scientific American Mind. I would subscribe to it if I were you. In 2005, we were getting so much information about the difference between boy and girl brains, they did a special edition. And then they did it again in December 2012. That wasn't that long ago. There'll probably be another one coming out. Please read these because there are things in them that I can't even begin to cover. And we are staggered by the differences in the brains of, of boys and girls. The reason I suggest things like this, have you heard, I think uh, Ned talked something about uh, the Einstein toys or whatever. Have you heard that if you play Mozart music to your babies, they score higher on intelligence tests? It's not true. It's not true. And yet, millions of dollars of Mozart tapes or CDs have been sold to you. And the Einstein toy people are being sued for millions of dollars because it's not true. So when you read something in that prestigious journal USA Today <laughs> that tells you it's based on brain research, don't trust it and go to really solid kinds of sources, and you will see that. By the way, do you know what it was in the one study that showed the Mozart music thing? It was the intelligence of the parents who routinely played Mozart music to their children. So it was the gene pool. Isn't that something? It's what we call a confounding variable. So my mantra to you as parents, and if some of you are teachers is, there's many gender differences above the neck that we need to understand and respond to, like how to teach reading to boys differently uh, or on a different timeline, like getting girls when they're three and four to start playing with moving toys with wheels and things like Ferris, little mini Ferris wheels and blocks and connects. Because those natural tasks of play, depending on what the play is, is later related to all the subject areas they're going to take, okay? So play uses the same parts of the brain that will be used later for any subject area you think of. And if all of your play, or much of it is language-based, and not spatial, and not visual, and not motoric, anytime you take a subject area that requires one of those parts of the brain, later it won't work well. That's why play is so important. Because during the first five years of life, the brain was designed to do what we call natural tasks. And then it makes muscular all these natural areas. Then when you ask it to do weird things, an artificial task like reading, all those separate rubber bands start working together. And if they're all big enough, they've been made big enough by play and doing, then they pull their weight. Let me give an example. If you brain image a fluid reading person, you get three big red spots. One back here for visual, one up here for auditory and phonemic, and one up here for language. The dyslexic brain, one, two, or all three, the rubber bands are too small. So to fix it, we don't have them do the artificial task of reading. If you're a visual dyslexic and the, the letters float on you, we may have you do more puzzles or tangrams to stretch that part so that when it combines to do reading, it pulls its weight. If it's the sound part, we may have you do things with beginning sounds of objects and things to stretch the auditory discrimination part so that when it combines to do reading, it pulls its weight. Do you hear what I'm saying? Please don't fall for early academic. It is actually causing issues in the human brain. But my other part of the mantra to you is this. 
we have to understand. For instance, I'm going to show you that boys and girls learn on a different timeline, but sometimes we have to also go against it. Let me give you an example. The emotional part of the brain, the amygdala, looks like a little almond that's deep in the head. It is connected to all the thinking parts of the brain with big neurons. Did you hear me? It is the motivational center of the brain. It controls all the other parts. And there are gender differences. <laughs> There's a part deep in your head, in the middle, not quite down to the amygdala, but in the thinking part called the ACC, the anterior cingulate cortex. It's right in here. It, like all the other parts, is connected to the amygdala. The ACC gets activated and recognizes when you make a mistake. That's all it does. It was designed to help learning. Like if you're a little Inuit Eskimo and you go out into the white world and your foot steps on a color white and you're, you start to go under, the ACC goes off and goes, hey, don't step on that color white again. You're going to die. And when the ACC goes off, it actually enhances learning. That's why we say to you, we want your kids to fall and make mistakes, not stand behind them so that they don't fall. We want them to hit another kid over the head with a block so that they find out when that kid bites them back, they'll never do it again. <laughs> because this doesn't do what the ACC does, OK? So the ACC is critically important. And remember I said it's connected to the amygdala? Oh dear, this bothers me as a female. <laughs> when the ACC goes off, the left amygdala, you have a left and a right, in a female, the left amygdala gets activated. And guess what the left amygdala tends to feel? Fear, anxiety, guilt, and shame. <laughs> in most male brains, when the ACC goes off, the right amygdala gets activated. <coughs> Anger, exhilaration, excitement. <laughs> you have to watch this if you have girls, because early on, when they make a mistake and it feels icky, if you compound that by saying, oh, you poor baby, oh, you poor thing, or worse, what did you do? you will paralyze that girl's risk-taking forever. Whereas if your little boy does it, he usually giggles. <laughs> or if he falls down and skins his knee and he is scared or whatever, what do you say? Come on, be a big boy. And you have him get over it so that he can take, do you hear the difference? We can take nature and ameliorate it. Come on, honey, little girl. Come on, let's go. You can do it. Instead of saying, what's wrong with you? Oh, you poor baby. I'm saying, you can do it. Come on, let's go. I need to ameliorate the connection that is gender stereotypic for a girl. For a boy, sometimes I need to ameliorate him and point out that if he continues to jump out of trees, he might do something other than get a bruise on his leg. Do you hear what I'm doing? And so one of the things that we're going to see with gender differences is that you must be the teeter-totter in their life if that gender stereotypic difference is not going to hold them in good stead throughout life. You're wondering what vip vop means. I don't blame you. I was been working in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and I was trying to explain the concept of you must be a teeter-totter parent with your child. They're not good at blocks. They don't like it. You must get them interested because it leads to certain kinds of thinking. You have a girl who's afraid to do things. You must get her to do things because that's what will change it. And I'm trying to explain teeter-totter, or and then I use seesaw, and they had no idea what I was talking about. So finally, did you know they speak Dutch there? <laughs> Anyhow, finally, <laughs> yeah, the librarian leaned forward and she said, I'm not allowed to step there. The librarian leaned forward and said, say vip vop. And I went, you have to be vip vop. They go, oh, oh, oh. 
We know from the brain research that if I use a unique terminology, you will tend to remember it better. Isn't that something? So now I want you to now picture yourselves as vip voppers. <laughs> Not that you want your children to become the human being you want them to become. Please don't hear me say that. Every child's unique. They will always have strengths and weaknesses but you have some stretchability with the rubber bands early. And if you have somebody who is a fearful uh, type of child who's afraid of everything, I have one, Dana. She was born a world-class warrior. On a scale of one to 10 in terms of type of warrior, she's an 11. <laughs> that meant that her left amygdala was huge and her right amygdala was smaller. Courage, excitement, aggression. And because you can't cut this because it's called a lobotomy, <laughs> the only way to deal with it is to stretch the courage side by taking risks and doing things, even when you're afraid. We call it hug the monster. She's been hugging the monster for 20 years, and now her brain looks like this. Had that not been dealt with, had somebody said to her, oh, poor thing, here, I'll do it for you. I know you're afraid. No, you don't have to take swimming lessons. I see that you're throwing up by the side of the pool. <laughs> you know, I gave her a handkerchief and a glass of water, and then we got in the pool. <laughs> so you're vip voppers, okay? I'm now going to skip some really good slides. You should invite me back, they're so good. But we just don't have time, we just don't have time. So let me jump to this. I'm gonna prove my case of gender differences. By the time, what time am I done? Hmm. Oh Lord, I'm in trouble, I'm done. This can't be right. Is it right back there? Crap, well you have to at least see this, okay? And then I'm gonna give you a PDF of all the lists and the ages that you asked for, okay? But you must see this movie. I'm gonna be two minutes late. They, you were two minutes late coming back. Boys and girls Listen. are not the same. At Rutgers Medical School, the researchers like to get their human guinea pigs young before the world has left its mark on them. Extensive tests have shown that a sex difference in temperament shows up early. Babies are seated in front of a screen and given a string they can pull to change the picture in front of them. Boys and girls learn equally fast, but they react differently when the switch they've learned to control is secretly disconnected. The boys keep pulling. Harder and harder. But with the girls, it's different. They get upset and give up. The difference shows in babies as young as six weeks. Six weeks. They don't know if they're boys and girls. This is not learned. A couple of quick things. First of all, this is a dated video. You could tell by the size of the computer, but it still holds, okay? About 80% of the girls immediately showed some startle, some negative. About 80% of the boys just kept going. 20% of each gender did something more like the other. So we have what we call 80 percenters and 20 percenters. And I want you to know which your child is. That doesn't mean they're homosexual. It just means that the emotional motivational center is slightly different. We have very sensitive boys and very non-sensitive girls. And then we have the range. I want you to think over 20 years, if these children are not vip vopped, what kind of characteristics they will develop. The boy for instance. Good characteristics. Problem solving, pers perseveration, persistence, independence. Aren't those wonderful? Keep them. But you must vip-vop him enough to get him to express himself, 
ask for help, learn to work with others, learn to accept other people's opinions. Do you see what happens if you don't? If he won't develop those. We even see language impairment with boys who don't begin to try to ask for help or to, to um, express themselves. With the girl, think of 20 years of that behavior, what it leads to. Good things. Social savviness. I know what kind of people will help me and what kind of people will say, do it yourself. Good communication skills. Good self-expression skills. Aren't those wonderful? Keep them. I know. The lights are going to go. The negative ones? Victim. Learned helpless. Open to peer pressure. Make them take risks. Make them do it on their own periodically or frequently. My main message to you, I'll give you the list in the PDF of all the things that you can see of gender differences and the ages, your job as a parent is to figure out which ones in the first 10, I'm generous, I'll give you 15 years of life. There's a book out there called Driving Your Adolescent Brain. You've got 20 years to help them mess with them. You will never change them completely, but you can outfit them for a lifetime. Thank you.